So what do we expect from random numbers? So we know we basically want them to be between zero and one, right? So they need to be uniformly distributed between zero and one. So a sequence of random numbers, when you generate a sequence of them, the sequence itself must conform to two important statistical properties. And one of them is basically the uniformity property, which means these random numbers in the sequence must be distributed uniformly between zero and one. Okay, which means a random number can likely come from any location between zero and one. If we have two subintervals with equal lengths, then these two intervals should have the same probability to generate a random number. So the random numbers should likely to come from any point with equal chances. So how do we represent that uniformity property? We say that a random number within the sequence must be uniformly distributed between zero and one. It must follow a continuous uniform distribution between zero and one. And the independence property indicates that when you generate a random number with a random number generation scheme, the next random number must be independent of all previous random numbers that are generated. So actually, human mind is not very capable of performing that. OK, so I'm just going to explain you with this example. I mean, for years and years, I'm offering this simulation class. And when we were giving classes in a face to face environment in the classroom, we were always performing this experiment with the students. So remember the die output generation simulation. So we have already practiced this and we practice this same procedure at classroom. We say that we are not going to use any random numbers or nothing at all, no computer. And so we do not have a die, but we are going to generate the output of a die by everybody. OK, all together, everybody is just going to choose one integer from one to six in the class. OK, so I tell everyone in the classroom and I ask them to come up with an integer from one to six according to the distribution of a die, of course, and everybody keeps a number in their mind. Then all together in the classroom, I ask how many students have chosen one, how many students have chosen two, how many students have chosen three, so and so forth. Now, most of the students do not choose one and six. OK, usually the intention, the tendency to choose a number between two and five. So the probability that a human might to choose the integers one or six when they want to imitate the output of a fair die is basically false. OK, so the tendency is not replicating the behavior of the fair die, unfortunately. And when I ask them to generate another random number in the next experiment, usually everybody chooses a different number. OK. So actually, when you choose, when you toss a die, and if the output is four, for example, in the next toss, the output is also likely to be four with one over six probability because it should be independent from your previous toss, right? But if a human mind intends to replicate the output of a die, in the next number, they always generate another. I mean, they always think that the previous was four, the next one, must be something different. Unfortunately, human mind has lots of such tendencies. The randomness that they create in their mind cannot conform to the independence property. However, if we are going to generate a random number sequence, the next number in the sequence must be independent of all previously generated random numbers. So, for example, if you have a random number which is close to 0 0.1, you should not intentionally generate another random number, which is far from the other one. So this means when you are going to generate the next random number, you should not care about all previous random numbers generated. So how we can develop a random number generation scheme where the sequence of random numbers conform to these two properties? The question is this. Now, first, we need to understand the property of uniformity. 
And this requires understanding the continuous uniform distribution and continuous uniform random variable. So we say that a continuous random variable R is said to be uniformly distributed between zero and one if its probability density function is equal to one between zero and one and if it is equal to zero elsewhere. So remember, this is the probability density function of a continuous uniform random variable, which is supposed to be distributed between zero and one. And we call such continuous uniform random variables standard uniform random variables, remember. So R here is a standard uniform random variable. And you know, we are representing a continuous random variable with its probability density function. And through that probability density function, we can also generate the cumulative distribution function, which gives us the probability of the random variable of interest to be less than or equal to certain value. The uniform random variable has a constant PDF, whether it is standard or not, it does not matter. But when it is standard, that constant PDF becomes equal to one. So a constant PDF and also a linearly increasing CDF between the lower bound and the upper bound. So here, because the constant PDF is equal to one, the CDF is going to be equal to X because the integral of a one is equal to X. And the CDF is just going to remain as zero up to the lower bound. Between lower bound and upper bound, it is going to be a linearly increasing function and it is going to be an identity function. So f of x is going to be equal to x. And when the x value is going to be greater than 1, the CDF reaches to its maximum value of 1. Therefore, it remains at this value. So the CDF of a continuous uniform random variable is given in this form. It gives us the probability of a standard uniform random variable to be less than or equal to x. And what is the probability of a standard uniform random variable to take values within a B interval that is a subset of the unit interval? So we are imagining here A and B are values within zero and one such that A is less than or equal to B. So this is just the subset interval within the zero one interval within the unit interval. What is the probability of or standard uniform random variable to be in this interval, it is the CDF at lower bound subtracted from the CDF at the upper bound, and that is basically equal to the length of that interval. So for a standard uniform random variable, the probability of it to reside within an interval that is defined in the unit interval is going to be equal to the length of that interval. Now, these figures are showing you respectively the probability density function on the left hand side and the cumulative distribution function on the right hand side of the standard uniform random variable. So we have a constant PDF between zero and one and everywhere else the PDF is equal to zero. So you do not see it. And the CDF starts at zero. And starting from the lower bound of the domain of the random variable, it increases linearly up to one. At the upper bound, it reaches one and then remains constant. Due to this constant PDF, we also have the symmetristic property. And for a symmetric PDF, the expected value of that random variable is just the middle point, of course. So it should be 0 0.5. So there is, of course, a formal way of calculating that. We need to multiply x with the PDF as a, a function of x, of course. And we are going to integrate x times the PDF through the uh, domain of that random variable, which is 0, 1 interval. And we know the PDF is constant and equal to 1. Therefore, all we need to integrate is x. And it integrates as x squared over 2, plugging in the upper bound and lower bound and calculating the difference gives you a 1 over 2. So the expected value of a standard uniform random variable is 1 over 2. And how about its variance? 
In order to compute the variance, you need to compute the expected value of the square of that random variable and subtract the square of the expectation from that if you intend to use the convenient formula of variance. And that requires integration of x squared times PDF. This time you will get a 1 over 3 and you subtract the square of the expectation which is 1 over 4 from 1 over 3 and that is equal to 1 over 12. So a standard uniform random variable is a random variable with expected value 1 over 2 and variance 1 over 12. So why do we explain this? We are going to come to that point. Okay, so we understand that the random numbers that we are going to generate through an algorithm must be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And if a sequence of random numbers, so let's just say, we are going to generate a sequence of length n, capital N here. If a sequence of random numbers are really uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, if we divide the unit interval 0, 1 into n subintervals of equal length. For example, imagine the die example. We were dividing the unit interval into equal length subintervals each has the length of 1 over 6. So from 0 to 1 over 6, from 1 over 6 to 2 over 6, so on and so forth. Now, we are generalizing this and we are using a lowercase n value and we are dividing our unit interval into lowercase n subintervals of equal length. In that case, every subinterval must approximately have equal number of observations. So the expected number of observations in each interval must be equal to capital N divided by N. So if you have a capital N number of uh, random numbers in a sequence, approximately capital N over N of them must fall into any of these subintervals. So depending on the number of subintervals that you are, of course, uh, creating here. Now, Another property is the independence property. And we say that if these random numbers generated in this sequence are independent, then this means the probability of observing a random number in a particular interval is independent of the previous values withdrawn. So this means, let's just say i is the next random number that we are going to generate. The probability that the i random number in the sequence to be between a and b values where a and b is a subinterval within the unit interval, given that all previous random numbers are generated and they have been recorded, okay, so all previous random numbers are known. This probability must be equal to the probability of the next random number again to be within that interval, given that you do not know anything about the previous random number. So you need to close your eyes to everything else that is generated so far. The probability of the next number to be between A and B interval will always be B minus A. Now, as I have said, if you generate random numbers by your mind, the human tendency is to usually generate a different and significantly different random number compared to the previous one. So actually, as you have a chance to generate a far random number from the previous one, the same chance applies for a closer value as well. But the human tendency is always to change the previously generated random number. So we say that we should not do that and all previously generated random numbers are insignificant when you are going to generate the next random number. The probabilistic property of the next random number should be, again, independent of all previously generated random numbers.